Good morning. How are you all doing today? Warm enough? Excellent. Here's the thing. Here's my favorite story to tell on days like today. There was a farmer and a preacher. And it was Sunday morning. And it was a big snowy day like it is today. And the farmer came in and the preacher said, well, do you think we should have church? And the farmer said, you know, if um, I only have one cow that shows up, I usually feed him. So they went ahead and they had worship and they got done. And the preacher said to the farmer, well, how did you like worship? And he said, well, um, usually if only one cow shows up, I don't dump the whole load. <laughs> so you guys can let me know whether I dump the whole load when we're all done today. Uh, just a number of announcements that we have for you. Um, this coming Wednesday, we hope everything's going to be settled down a little bit. And um, we're planning on having in our um, forum group that meets at 645, Dan Rudd is going to bring a number of individuals over from Horizon Recovery. And they're going to talk about what it took to get them through what it was that they were addicted to and um, they call it recovery testimonies and they're normally fascinating so um, I would kind of recommend those to you. If you have any kids that are um, seniors in high school um, foundation scholarships are um, or at least the applications for them are available and we would encourage you to pick those up. Um, also I would remind you that um, after worship is over We'll see how this goes today. Um, we're going to have drive-through communion for anybody who wants. We're kind of doing that on the days that we have communion. So we did it last night. We're going to do it today. Um, we'll do it in a couple of weeks when um, communion is um, done over on the other side. We'll always do it after the service that people are used to are, are have have just had that had communion at it. Um, that's when we'll do the communion. So um, just trying to make sure that if there's people out there that would like to take communion but are not comfortable coming to church, that we kind of still are open to serve them as well. So anyway, um, the other thing is, is it's just hard to tell who everybody, I think I know who most of, anybody here a church council member elected? Okay, just wanted to make sure because of the masks that that was there. Um, we, were, we were going to have a church council installation, but we'll do that at another time. So anyway, would the, con would the congregation please stand? Peace of the Lord be with you all. Please share that peace with one another. And our worship continues with the order for confession and forgiveness as followed from the front cover of your bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The opening hymn is All Are Welcome.
este leison Kyrie eleison Glory to God, glory to God. Let us join in the prayer of the day. Everlasting God, you give strength to the weak and power to the faint. Make us agents of your healing and wholeness, that your goodness may be made known to the ends of your creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the first reading. first reading comes from Isaiah 40, verses 21 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in. Who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble, to whom then will you compare me or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. 
Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. The psalm reading today comes from Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11 and 20c. Hallelujah! How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant it is to honor God with praise. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem and gathers the exiles of Israel. The Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. The Lord counts the number of the stars and calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. There is no limit to God's wisdom. The Lord lifts up the lowly but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music upon the harp to our God, who covers the heavens with clouds and prepares rain for the earth, making grass to grow upon the mountains. God provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they cry. God is not impressed by the might of a horse and has no pleasure in the speed of a runner, but finds pleasure in those who fear the Lord, in those who wait God's steadfast love. Hallelujah. And the second reading comes from 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 23. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if, it, if I do this of my own will, I have a reward, but if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win, win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might be all means, might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel so that I may share in its blessings. Here ends the reason. Please stand for that, will you? The Gospel reading for us today is taken from the Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter, beginning with the 29th verse. As soon as they, that is Jesus and the disciples, left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. 
and he cured many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I have come out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in the synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of our Lord. Congregation may remain standing. The hymn is, Although I Speak with Angel's Tongue. Congregation may be seated. And I have a children's sermon for all of the slightly smaller Lutherans and the slightly larger ones who don't want to listen to the big main sermon. So anyway, there were three friends, friends and they worked in the kitchen. One of them was <coughs> Mr. Pot. One of them was Miss Spoon, and the other one was Mrs. Towel. And they got along really well until they started getting jealous of one another or started to wonder which one of them was better or which one of them was more important. And they started to get really separated from one another because they weren't sure that they liked that until they finally got an idea that maybe it would be a good thought. Maybe it would be a good thought if they tried to understand the other person by becoming like them, by trying to do their job. And so, Mr. Pot tried to make sure that the other ones got dry, but he wasn't very good at it at all. And Mrs. Towel wanted to try to stir things, but she just got all soppy. And when Miss Spoon tried to have things cook, she found out that that was really hot. And suddenly what happened was is that trying to become 
like what the other one was. They understood one another and they were hopeful that they would get together and they would be friends and relate with one another more and more and more because they would appreciate what the other one was. This is a little bit like what St. Paul says when he says, to a Jew I became as a Jew, and to those under the law I became as one under the law, and to those outside the law I became as outside the law. The idea was, let's see if we can't try to understand who the other person is so that we can all get along and do what we're supposed to do. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for friends that are different than us so that we can all become everything you've asked us to be. Amen. Okay, so here we are at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, just about exactly halfway through Paul's first letter to the church at a place called Corinth. I mention that fact because it seems dangerous to me sometimes. To lift scripture out of its context and preach it like there was no reason, there was no history, there was no context, there was for the words to stand the way they do. Let's just say for now that when St. Paul talks about having a commission to preach, when he talks about choosing to take no reward, when he talks about not extending his rights in the gospel or making full use of them, when St. Paul talks about that to the Jews he became as a Jew and to those outside the law he became as those outside the law and to those under the law he became as those under the law and to those who were weak he became as the weak, there's a context for that. And we'll get to it in a second, but, but actually to begin this sermon, um, this is kind of what I was thinking about when I was reading through 1 Corinthians this week. When I was a kid, um, there was a song that was out. Maybe some of you recognize it, maybe some of you don't. I'm, I'm sure, actually, it's been re-recorded enough times that it went like this. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. If you guys are familiar with that song, it was first recorded by Jackie DeShannon. It was then later recorded by Dionne Warwick. It was also recorded by Burt Bacharach by Andra Day, by the Berkeley College School of Music students by Zoom this last year. It was done by Cadence and Kevin. It was done by Rita Wilson. It was done by Rachel Reyes. It was done by the cast of Glee, and that is not even working through the entire first page of all of the YouTube things that I had scrolled down on. Actually, what happened was it said, there are 194 more lines. And so I pushed, I ran down all the way to the bottom of it. And then there was a button that said, push if you would like to see more. So apparently, apparently this is kind of a timeless message that what the world needs now is love, sweet love. How many of you guys think we're doing a better job at that now than we were 30 years ago? Yeah, me either. So let's see if I can put this in the context of scripture. So back, way, way back. Way, way back in the first century when Paul was traveling the Mediterranean and starting churches, there was this one church in a place called Corinth. It was an extremely urban place. It was actually for cities of the time, it was pretty wealthy. Um, it was very cosmopolitan for its age. It was a city that was situated on this little isthmus separating the area of Achaia from the rest of Greece. 
it was on this little isthmus, which means that it had water on two sides of it. On one side, there was the Gulf of Corinth, and on the other side, there was the Saronic Gulf, which led right out to the Mediterranean Sea. Paul thought it was a wonderful place to start a church. With all of the travel, with all of the commerce that would be going in and out from this place, this city, setting up a church here would be ideal because it would be the place where people would come in and they would go out and they would be able to take the gospel that they might learn there and then bring it to the whole rest of the known world. But what Paul found out was what the world needed now was love, sweet love. It was the only thing there was just too little of. So here's my question for you. How many ways do you think you can divide a community? How many ways do you think you can rip apart the relationships that would take place within a group of people? How many ways do you think that you can split up a church? This is what was happening in the church of Corinth in the time since Paul had started the church in Corinth till the time when he thought it was necessary to write a letter to be able to begin to straighten them out a little bit. Number one, some people were gathering around a specific leader. Some said, I belong to Paul. Others said, I belong to Apollos. Others said that I belong to Cephas. Others said that I belong to Christ, as if Christ could be divided. But that wasn't all. Number two, there were some people who were richer and some people who were poorer. And that became apparent at places like worship, because when they did communion, which in that day was done as a whole meal, think about it more like a potluck like we do today, where everybody would bring food in and they would bring wine in. But the problem was that in Corinth, what people started to do was the richer ones who had more, the ones who had time off, the ones who didn't have to work as long as the other ones, the ones who probably weren't slaves would show up and they would start eating and almost all of the food would be gone and all of the wine would be gone before the poorer ones got there. And that became very apparent on what the divide was between them. But that wasn't all. Number three, there was problems with church discipline. And there were problems with morality and how that should be dealt with. There were problems with one member suing another member and there were lawsuits between them and how the church should handle that. That wasn't all though. Number four, there were questions about whether they should be able to eat food that had been offered to idols. Number five, there were debates about the role of women in the church and society. Number six, there were questions, apparently heated discussions about spiritual gifts and which ones were the greatest, which sounds to me like they were more interested in power and control and hierarchy and position, which led to debates over orderly worship that were taking place. Number seven, there were divisions among them over theology. Number eight, actually, I could go on and on. Let's just put it this way. When pastors get together who have been in the ministry for a while, who have had different churches, some of them talk about which church was their Philippi. When they say that, that means that was the church they really loved. And some pastors talk about which church was their Corinth, and that was the one they're glad they're away from. So how many ways do you think you can split a people? I actually thought about being a little sarcastic here and saying, thank God over 2,000 years we've got that all figured out, right? Thank God that never happens to us anymore, right? Ways to split a group of people, ways to break relationships, even have that happen in religious life in a church. Paul has a lot of things to say in 1 Corinthians about healing and about unity and about oneness. First, he says, you know, we're really all like one body. And we all have different parts. We all have different places. We all have different gifts. We all need one another. Secondly, Paul says, when he's talking about the idea that now, there were some people in the church of Corinth who thought they must have been smarter or had special knowledge compared to other people. And Paul wrote that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And so I'm going to paraphrase Paul here. But what he basically ends up saying is, you're not as smart as you think you are. 
And probably when you get to heaven, there's going to be some things that you're going to be surprised that you were right about, and there's going to be some things that you were wrong about. So maybe you shouldn't be so conceited now. Thirdly, Paul points out that there are no rich or no poor. There are just brothers and sisters. There are no Jews and there are no Greeks. There are just brothers and sisters. Fourthly, he points out that everything, everything was not supposed to be for yourself. Everything was supposed to be about the other. So hold back at communion until others are there. Hold back in worship, speaking in tongues, for that's only for you and not for everyone. Hold back eating food offered to idols, not that it's wrong or illegal, but that somebody who's weaker in the faith might fall because of that. Hold back on taking full advantage of your rights. St. Paul says, finally, that, 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 that kind of gets us to the context for the text for today. Paul says he doesn't preach. There's no boasting in that. He says that he simply preaches because he has a commission laid on him. But then he says he's not going to take full advantage. He's not going to make full use of his rights in the gospel. And you might ask what those were. Paul chooses not to take an income for preaching because he doesn't want anybody, incidentally a choice I have not made, Paul chooses to take no income and instead work at doing other things so that the gospel might be presented freely, so that that might not become a stumbling block to anybody else. Paul says he doesn't do this for a reward so that other people would know. He says that he is free, but he chooses to make himself a slave so that other people might be benefited by that. And then St. Paul says, to the Jews I became as a Jew. To those under the law I became as one under the law. To those outside the law he became as one outside the law. To the weak he became as the weak. Now not that Paul is being two-faced or double-sided or he's not a chameleon. He's not doing it to be arrogant or to be conceited. He just tries to understand. It's just that he didn't want his person to overcome his message. He didn't want his presentation to overcome the gospel. He didn't want the culture to overcome the preaching because Paul knew, I mean, I think that Paul really knew that the only way that you can win people over, the only way that you can open a door in their hearts. The only way that you can eventually make sure that there's a difference in people's behavior or in what they believe is through the power of relationship. So Paul sought not to divide, but to unite. Paul sought not to win, but to relate. Not to rule, but to love. And so perhaps maybe the greatest known passage out of this book of 1 Corinthians becomes one on how you build those relationships through love and how God has done that with us and how we ought to do that with one another. And he says, love is not jealous or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. You know the rest of it, of course. We know it because we've relegated it to weddings. When it was supposed to be about so much more. A timeless truth overcoming divisions with the power of loving relationships. We know we still crave it. We still sing for it. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing there's just too little of. Paul figured that the best way to do that was not to impose it or make other people bow to a rule or cancel other people or demand their conformity.
there's a commercial that's out right now that when it first came out, I just kind of cocked my head and said, there's something off on that, at least in my un understanding. I mean, have you ever seen, have you seen the commercial where it's got the woman that's singing, walk a mile in my shoes, walk a mile in my shoes. I finally figured out what bothered me about it is it's backwards. The idea, if you want to promote peace and unity and healing and hope in a community, isn't that you demand that other people understand who you are. It's not that we demand somebody walks a mile in our shoes. It's that we extend ourselves to walk a mile in theirs. It's that we're the ones who try to do the understanding rather than the ones who demand that other people understand us. It's what God did in Jesus Christ what he, when he became human. God didn't demand godliness out of us. God took humanity onto himself. It's what St. Paul tries to do when he says that to the Jews I became a Jew and to those under the law I became as one under the law and to the weak I became as the weak. You know, we can read what Paul has to say about love all we want to. We can sing about wishing we had love because it's the only thing there's just too little of in the world. But God in Christ and what Paul tried to do in Corinth is not just to tell you we need those things, but to show you how. So hopefully one day we can achieve it and not just sing for it. And invite the congregation to stand as we sing the next hymn. Let us join in the Nicene Creed as printed in your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, 
was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the hand of the Father. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. I will end each petition with, let us pray. Please respond. Have mercy, O God. For the church, for ministries of healing and wholeness, for hospital, hospice, and military chaplains, for those serving in prison, in prison ministry, and care facilities in the name of Christ, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For creation, for insects in the grass, clouds on the mountaintops, for cattle and the rainwater they drink, for the humility to take our place among all creatures of the earth. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For the nations, for all who lead in cities and towns, states and countries, for community organizers, school officials and CEOs, for international health organizations, that in times of trial, fear or hopelessness, they find freedom in service to those most in need. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For all wearied by life's burdens, for those who are in need, for those lacking supportive relationships, for those crushed by debt, for those struggling with chronic pain or other sickness, for those exhausted from overwork or stress, and for all who cry out to you, let us pray. For this congregation, for outreach and social ministries centered here, for parish nurses and visitors, for ministries of companionship and support, for the young people in this place who open us to new understandings, let us pray. In thanksgiving for the faithfully departed, who are who were called by name and now rest from their labors, Lord, we lift up Charles Buss, that his life and their and all other lives serve as witnesses to the goodness of God. Let us pray. For all human beings on earth who search for unconditional love, may they find it in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. And merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And let us continue with the words that the Lord taught us in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now let us join in our closing hymn. Please be seated.
continue on with the communion sermon or service after I um, am done doing that please when you're ushering out of the back with large crowds like we have for today make sure that you don't clump up together too much um, communion will be served in the gathering area as we have done that recently um, we will also um, then be underneath the awning for anybody who would like to have drive up communion In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread or drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please follow the instruction of the ushers. <laughs> 